We are Osra Academy, bringing you virtual learning direct to your desktop or mobile device, wherever you are and whenever you need it. We believe in the value of appropriate and relevant clinical education and have a wide range of learning formats specifically for you. Whether this is for your own CPD, product insight and awareness, or detailed training relevant to your own clinical needs, we provide a huge range of remote learning opportunities specifically tailored to you. We bring together key opinion leaders, sharing insights into orthopedic and prosthetic clinical pathways. Our own clinical and professional sales teams offering you detailed product insight and evidence-based education. Large-scale, secure webinars, professionally managed, providing real-time diagnostics and support. Open meetings, allowing for multi-site interaction and knowledge sharing. Contact us now to arrange your own virtual training and education meeting and visit our website to browse our back catalogue of webinars and other online education events. We are Osser Academy, providing your educational needs. Hi, good evening and welcome. Thanks for attending uh, this evening on what is the 16th KOL webinar of 2020, coming live as always from our Manchester office. Uh, but tonight we're taking the KOL webinar on the road. Tonight we're coming live also from the Biomechanics Clinic in Norwich uh, with our speaker Ian Sadler, Tori, a live patient, and our colleague Ajmia. So if we can go to Norwich and say hi to you all, looking good over there. Um, so a little bit different to keep things interesting for you. So hopefully all goes well technically, although I think at the start there might have been some technical issues. So hopefully that's them out of the way, uh, as we said, or it could be car crash this evening, who knows. But either way, it'll be good viewing. Uh, so really interesting topic this evening as Ian takes us through the foot and ankle and gait, followed by live gait demonstration and discussion from Ian's Biomechanics Clinic in Norwich. So normally what would happen is we go through the camera angles here in the office. Uh, but tonight, we're going to go through the camera angles we have set up in Norwich. So if we can go live to Norwich, uh, if we go to, to Ian, first of all, we have the front view uh, where Ian will be presenting from. Uh, we all have so a front view camera uh, where Ian will be able to go through the, the gate uh, and discuss live with, uh, with Tori there, who's our live patient. We also have a side view uh, camera angle um, where we'll be able to walk and Ian will be able to talk through. And also, Aj, our colleague, is, is uh, manning the dynamic camera, so be able to point and exactly and get different camera angles. So uh, it's a little bit different from for tonight. It makes uh, my and Giles's life a little bit easier. All the pressure is on our colleague Ad. So thanks to Ad. Um, so we can go to the front view camera back in Manchester. Uh, just to go through a couple of housekeeping rules if you've not joined one of our webinars before. Uh, so there's a Q&A function down at the bottom uh, uh, of your screen. So do ask as many questions as you can. Giles will be manning that this evening. Uh, so do keep them coming for Ian. Uh, there's also a chat function if you want to ask any uh, questions or say hi to us this evening. Uh, we will be recording the session. Uh, it's usually posted between 48 and 72 hours after the live evening uh, on YouTube and also on the OSA webinar channel. Uh, and for your attendance this evening, you'll receive an e-certificate. Usually it takes, again, between 24 and 48 hours for you to receive that. Uh, and that also includes uh, a questionnaire. Um, so if you do have any topics you'd like us to cover, or any ways you feel we can improve the webinar form format, then please do fill them out and, and send them back. Uh, so before we uh, move over to Ian, I uh, just want to go through Ian and, uh, and introduce him. Ian is a clinical director and podiatrist of the Biomechanics Clinic in Norwich. He is passionate about his work with biomechanics, assisting a wide range of people, from those suffering from debilitating arthritis to elite sports people. Ian is involved in spreading the word on the importance of understanding biomechanics to physiotherapists, chiropractors and osteopaths, and lectures on biomechanics throughout the world. Ian first became interested in the area of biomechanics during his time serving as a battlefield medic in the British Army in elite and special forces, where he treated many lower limb injuries in various fields of operation. After leaving the Army, Ian worked for the NHS before joining the UK's leading biomechanics technologies company as its principal clinician and orthotics consultant, where he is involved in the development of pioneering gait analysis technology. So I'm sure you'll agree we're very lucky to have Ian speaking for us this evening. Uh, I hope you do enjoy the evening. Uh, with that, we shall go from here, live in Manchester, to live in Norwich, where I believe they're not in lockdown, uh, like we are. And, uh, and I hope you enjoy the evening. Over to you, Ian. Hello, and welcome to Norwich, as you say, not in lockdown. And uh, for those of, uh, just I thought a quick note to start with, for those, anyone watching it on the repeat or the uh, recorded webinar, 
the face masks are because of COVID, it's not because of agricultural smells from out here in, uh, in Norfolk. So uh, before we, as we start, so first of all, one, just share my screen so you can have a look at the presentation there. So first thing we're gonna do, uh, I think we were gonna take a quick poll in fact of um, who we've got watching today. So I think they can put the poll up for us. And if you could just take a few seconds there to go through and just click down there as to what profession you are. I feel like we need some music for this bit. <laughs> um, so yeah, we've got about 85% of people have answered. Um, I'll just give it a couple more seconds and then I'll stop that and share that with you there. So, <laughs> so we have, uh, Two consultants, registrars or doctors. Uh, we have 20 orthotists, 67% uh, are physiotherapists, 4% are podiatrists, 1% OTs, 1% sports therapists and 10% other. Oh, the mystery other. Thanks very much for that, Giles. So um, hopefully we've, uh, we've got some interesting stuff for you. So what we're gonna go through this evening in this sort of, um, I'm terming it a workshop, essentially the key stances of um, the, sorry, the, few, the key phases of gait for the foot and ankle. So primarily we're interested in the stance phase here. So what is the foot and ankle doing when it's initially contacting the ground, when it's accepting your body weight onto the ground, when the foot becomes flat and therefore closed chain against the ground, um, when it reaches the tibial vertical and sometimes people call this um, when it's the other leg swings past the stance leg. We're then gonna use heel lift, and terminal stance. So they're the phases that we're gonna talk about in, 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 uh, for the foot and ankle function. Now, you will find different terminologies for these sorts of things if, as you go through the text yourself, um, but essentially, we're, for the ease of uh, my using the same terminology the whole time, we're gonna use these phrases. So I think we're gonna do a quick second poll uh, just to see how often our audience are doing any gait analysis themselves assessing the foot and ankle dynamically, I suppose, is what we're really interested. So is that daily, weekly, monthly, or rarely? So people are just coming in with those, we're up to about 50%. Leave that on for a few seconds more. Everyone's very quick today. <laughs> I think this is how we need to do all elections. <laughs> so we're up to 80%, I'll, I'll share that with you now. Um, so 36% uh, are <coughs> a daily performing gait analysis, 35% are doing it weekly, 14% uh, monthly, and then, 50, uh, sorry, 14% rarely. Okay, so it's actually quite a, quite a knowledgeable audience there, or certainly using it every day. So that's a, um, hopefully we'll find something for everyone to get from here. Uh, and we'll sort of start with the same terminology and uh, hopefully we'll use, um, we won't sort of spread too far off there. Uh, there will be an opportunity to ask questions as we're going, uh, but generally I think we'll be answering most of them towards the end of the, of the question answer bit. So how are we gonna break this down? So if we look at the foot and, foot and ankle in stance, we're gonna first of all just sort of go through what it's doing largely. So when it hits the ground, it's got to initially touch and sense where the ground is uh, and we turn that initial contact. That's usually the posterior lateral border of the calcaneus and we'll talk through why that is. Now, um, first thing to mention is we're primarily going to be talking about walking gait here. So uh, this isn't necessarily running and there's a lot more variety in the way we run uh, and the fit these particular phases. So we're going to stick with walking for the purpose of today. So uh, we're going to go from initial contact to load response. So as you go through the load response phase, this is your foot accepting your body weight, accelerating onto it uh, at the speed of gravity and being stopped in that acceleration by the force of ground. So we've got um, your body mass, gravity, and we've got ground reaction force. So they're the things that we're, your foot's got to deal with as it progresses your body over the top of it. Once your foot's become flat on the ground, uh, it can no longer plantar flex any, any further. So it can't do any downward action. So it becomes closed chain. So any action the musculature is doing is pulling against a surface that's more powerful than it. Um, once it's become flat against the ground, you then advance your tibia and therefore body weight forward over the top of it. 
So mid stance, we're sort of, uh, for the purpose of this, calling tibial vertical. All right, so as I said, it's often referred to as the, the time the other limbs, limb swings past. So for our, for our live model, that's gonna be the difficult part because you have to balance on one foot for a few minutes. Um, then as the other limb has swung past and it does its initial contact, we're looking at lifting the heel off the ground. As we lift the heel off the ground, the other foot then does its load response and we come into terminal stance. So that's sort of the phases that we're talking about. Now that whole sequence of events takes on average 0.4 to 0.6 of a second. So essentially, if we average that out to 0.5 a second, your foot's got half a second to hit the ground, load onto the ground, accept, accept your mass, move your mass forward, lift off and then be propelled forward for the next step. All right. Now, 0.4 of a second, 0.5 of a second is not very long to do that. And it has to achieve two polar opposite uh, functions. It has to um, attenuate for those forces. So like I said, the gravity, your body mass accelerating at the speed of gravity and ground reaction force. So it's got to deal with those forces and it does that through the action of pronation. So that's the rolling inwards of the talus and the ankle. Uh, essentially towards the other foot. That's probably the easiest way of uh, phrasing uh, pronation at that point, or more technically moving from a point of relatively inverted to relatively everted. So pronation is not a position, it's a movement that your foot has to go through to get from a relatively inverted position to a relatively everted position, and therefore become uh, able to accept that load onto the ground. Excuse me a second. <coughs> it then, uh, it will continue to pronate until it reaches mid stance. So once it's done the maximal amount of pronation, and we'll talk about how that's occurring in a minute with a live model, it has to re-supinate, so it has to become stiffer. So the act of pronation makes the foot more flexible, mobile, and it unlocks, slightly old fashioned term, but it um, de-stiffens, unstiffens the metatarsals. So hopefully we don't then break those on uneven surfaces. As you then, lift up and externally rotate the foot the supination creates the foot into a stiffer thing to become a lever to propel off okay so it has to be a mobile adapter and a floppy thing to accept the, um, the ground shape and your impact forces and it has to become a stiff lever again to propel off all in 0.4 to 0.6 of a second 10,000 times a day 365 days a year on whatever surface you happen to be putting it on all right so it's got to adapt to those different shapes of the ground. It's got to adapt to the different speeds that you're moving. It has to adapt to the different weights that you might be carrying. So if carrying bags, rucksacks, bags on the other hand, carrying and shopping, all those sort of things it's got to deal with and then sudden changes of direction, all right? But we're gonna primarily talk about a perfect footstep. So what are, what's the thing we're trying to attain with a footstep? Um, but if you do happen to see anybody with a perfect footstep, please send us a video of it because I've not seen it yet. All right. So it's not a very, uh, it's, a, it's an idealized version of what a footstep is going to be. Okay. So from there, we're going to come over to our live model and start talking through those different phases. So hopefully we can see that. Now should force us off the screen there. So first thing we're going to do assuming that this is a mid stance. So we're walking through the stance phase of the, of the step. So the first thing that we have to do is hit the ground. So we do initial contact. So as we said, that's usually the posterior lateral border of the calcaneus here. So we take, accept the load or we basically take our first contact there. Now, the reason that's the place that we tend to hit is most of us, We'll have a bit of a, a varus angle. So from the front, we can see that probably a little bit easier, a little bit of a bow in the shin, which then brings the foot inverted relative to the ground. And we also have the talus sitting a little bit inverted. All right, and we'll talk about how it does that in a second, which brings us contact in the ground. There are things also going on higher up, but we're focusing on the foot and ankle at this point. So for the bones, we've got the, the talus being relatively inverted relative to the ground, which brings that calcaneus inverted. So what's inverting that talus, again, if we come from the front view, we can see for Tori here, it's quite prominent. The tibialis anterior is contracting and its force of pull is going medial to the talus, which will be putting a rotation into inversion on there. 
Secondly, we tend to hold our toes up as we're walking. So the, uh, which you might be able to see from the side view here, we've got, we've got quite a, a uh, we're using the digit, the hallux extensor to prepare our foot ready for that ground. So the end of the swing phase and touching the ground we're there. That will also be having an effect of tightening the plantar fascia, which again has a supinatory force around the talus. All right. So they're the local things that cause us to hit on that posterior lateral border of the calcaneus. Now we tend to uh, get a lot of patients talk to us about that, the wear on the back of the heels. They'll often proudly show you the bottom of their shoes and talk to you about how, the, um, how, they're, how they're getting wear on the back. That's perfectly normal wear pattern, all right? And it's dictated to by those things we've just talked about. And for shoes, they'll often even reinforce that sort of area on the outside border of your heel. So, and it's the most common bit of the cobbler to fix. So we're thought, talking about generally, particularly if we're dealing with orthotics and things from this point forward. So how that, how that would affect it, okay? So I think that's probably all the things we want to talk about there. The other things which are happening at this point is we've got the perineals and the tibialis posterior acting as a stabilizer. So they're preparing the foot ready for whatever shape it happens to be hitting, all right? That's often pre-done, if you like, pre prepared for because you know what step you just took, all right? So hopefully we got some proprioceptive effects going on there at the same time. So at the next phase, we then accept our body weight onto the foot. So the body mass is accelerating onto the ground at the speed of the gravity. So it's not, it's not hitting the ground at the speed of gravity, it's accelerating, all right? So the ground reaction force is coming up the outside of the foot. It's hitting the posterior lateral border of the calcaneus still coming up the outside. The body mass coming down relatively interior to the or medial to the talus, which causes a pronatory moment. So that means that it creates a rotation force around that talus, causing it to pronate. So what that's doing, if I grab a foot model here. I think the side view one was going to be the best there. So if you're hitting the ground on the posterior lateral border, ground's coming up that way, body weight's coming down this way, it causes the talus to rotate medially, all right? So we get a medial drift and a plantar flexion of that talus. Uh, at the same time, it's going to pull the navicular down and the medial three cuneiforms. So we start to see a rotation of the foot as we go through. Now the tibialis anterior is still a primary decelerator of that. So we're eccentrically contracting our tibialis anterior and to a lesser extent to the digital extensors to decelerate that foot flapping onto the ground and to create a deceleration to that pronation force. So most of what's happening is going to be eccentric contraction, decelerating your body mass on as it, as it impacts onto the ground. The plantar intrinsics at this point are basically being perhaps held taut because we're in that uh, externally rotated position, all right? But generally, it's all, all ankle at this point. Once we've taken the load on and we put our foot flat onto the ground, so if you come forward there, perfect. You see immediately this tibialis anterior um, re, uh, goes to a rest position and the tibialis posterior suddenly becomes a bit more prominent. So as it comes around the ankle here and attaches, so the tibialis posterior, come, the tendon comes around the medial malleolus and attaches into the, hopefully a broad attachment on the inside and around the underneath of the um, sort of navicular cuneiform area. So often we, we talk about um, the tibialis anterior being an antipronator, but it's generally has an effect of being an antipronator for that initial part. So until the foot is flat on the ground, every bit that we advance the shin bone forward, the tibia forward, you disadvantage the tibialis anterior to be an antipronator. Okay, so if we just go back a little bit, perfect, thank you. But we can see the tibialis posterior becomes, it takes over and becomes the, the decelerator of that pronatory force. At this point, the, the talus is continuing to adduct and plantar flex. So it's continuing its journey from a relatively inverted to a relatively everted and plantar flexed um, posture, pulling the calcaneus around with it. So as it sits on the calcaneus, uh, we'll show that with the model here again. So as it sits on the calcaneus, it's a very good force coupling to rotate that round. So this is one of the reasons we often will measure 
the calcaneal angle as a surrogate marker for how much the talus has moved. It's not a true marker, but it's a surrogate marker. Okay, so at this point, we're in closed chain function, all right? So one thing that often gets overlooked is the deltoid ligament is going to act as, a, again, an antipronatory force. So that's not a contractile force, obviously. It's just an elastic recoil force. But the stretch receptors within there hopefully will start to tell us where our ankle is relative to the ground. So as you continue to do that sort of loading on and your foot becomes flat, these the, the uh, deltoid ligament running around the medial malleolus becomes a bit stretched. Tibialis posterior continues to be our primary decelerator of pronation. All right, so again, we're talking locally. So as the foot is being decelerated into that pronation, it's an eccentric contraction trying to control the roll in. All right, so we're always trying to decelerate it. Um, as you push the foot down, so as the talus becomes more medial and plantar flex, it relatively pushes the metatarsals upwards, all right? It will drag the navicular. So again, if I come to the side view, because it's easiest to see, as the talus moves medially, it drags the navicular medially with it and plantar flexes it, which then changes the relative position of the cuboid and the navicular allowing the forefoot to become more mobile and floppy. So this is where we lose that transverse metatarsal arch. So transverse metatarsal arch being made of a relatively plantar flexed first and fifth in as we rotate on, and then it disappears once we, as we roll through that sort of position. What that will be doing is tensioning the plantar fascia. So plantar fascia running from the medial calcaneal tubercle, um, in this particular description, primarily around the first metatarsal head, the drum effect we tend to talk about, and then the, the lesser three or four, depending on anatomical variants. So what that's doing is then being tensioned against that escape of the forefoot away from the rear foot. So as we do that pronatory force and ground will not give way, that pushes the forefoot up relative to the talus coming down, which then creates a more mobile forefoot. All right, so hopefully we don't then break those metatarsals. But at the same time, it's tensioning all of the, the, the plantar intrinsics and the um, plantar fascia as it's under there. All right. Uh, for Tori here, we can also see that she's working the abductor hallucius. So the muscle body being here, attachment being around the base of the first metatarsal uh, to stabilize that big toe. And that might be because we're asking her to stand still for quite a long period of time. Okay. So once we've done that, we continue to advance our shin over the top, and that would be, we won't make a stand for too long, but that would be when we're getting to this sort of point. So when we're swinging the other limb past. So our tibia becomes vertical, our body weight is, is hopefully on the top of, or slightly in front of our of our mass, of our, sorry, our mass is slightly in front of our foot. All right, and that should be the end of our pronation. That should be the, the, we, the final most point that we do that pronatory movement. And all of those things are under most tension at that point. So the tibialis anterior, because she's balancing, it's, uh, it's playing up. Uh, but it's primarily the tib post at that point. Okay, you can pop your other foot down, I think, as long as we've got you. Just mimic that just over the top, because otherwise you're going to fall over. All right, so we can see it's, as we get past the tib post is reaching its maximum sort of tension. All right, now, if for, as a, for an interest piece, if the tibialis posterior is not capable of doing that job, you'll tend to recruit the next available muscle, all right, which is the long digital flexor, all right? And if that's not able to do the job, you may recruit the long hallux flexor, all right? So you probably remember from your anatomy, we generally call that Tom, Dick and Harry so as a, a way to abridgedly remember that in the, in the exam. Uh, so essentially what can happen is if the tib post, tib post is not sufficiently powerful to resist that pronatory force, you end up with curly toes because if you use the next one, it's going to the digital extensor attaches into the distal phalanx, and you get a curly mover. All right, and it's an open end that you're trying to use to resist that pronatory force. All right, so as we then get past there, and the other foot does its initial contact, we end we then lift the heel off the ground. All right. So we've gone through, if we just do that a little bit slower, so we, we've gone through maximum pronation. And then as we swing past, the external rotation of the limb as a whole 
is what then creates a supernatory force at the ankle. All right, so the talus gets rolled in by the ground reaction force relative to your body mass, but it gets rolled back out again, primarily by the external rotation of the tibia, because the force coupling at the talocrural joint is extremely good. Um, so we get an external rotation there, but we also get a tensioning of the plantar fascia and the other plantar intrinsics, as well as the plantar ligaments, et cetera, that creates a supernatory force from the underside as well. So we get uh, a primary driver being external rotation, but we also get a secondary driver being the tightening of the plantar fascia as it goes around the drum of the metatarsal, all right? So this is what we call the windlass effect. It often gets demonstrated in a passive position where you stood there and lifted the toe up, but this is what we're doing dynamically. So we can see the, the big toe looks almost like a ratchet if we visualize the plantar fascia running under here and wrapping around it. And it's the same for the lesser toes. So as we do that dorsiflexion and your, this foot essentially gets dragged off the ground by your body mass moving forwards, we end up um, getting that sort of supernatory force being created around that um, the sort of uh, into the propulsive phase, all right? So this is having an effect of restacking the talus. So if I use the foot model again, uh, it's having an, I'll do to, to, to add here. So it's, it's having an effect of restacking the talus on top of the calcaneus and bringing the navicular back over the top of the cuboid. That has an effect of close packing the bones at the foot and lifting up. Now also that's going to bring the um, perineals into play into that propulsive phase. Now because the perineus longus has an attachment to the base of the first metatarsal, that then has a second a further closed packing effect on that midfoot. So we, we see these the, all the bones in the middle part of the foot being stiffened and closed packed as you come into that propulsive phase. Okay. Up until now, what the Achilles has been doing is basically storing energy from that landing and the stretching as you move the body weight over the top. The soleus has been primarily decelerating past when we get to mid stance to this point, it's decelerating and then it's using its elastic recoil to help pull you through, all right? So hopefully when we're walking, there's not too much muscular effort going on. We want to store energy with that pronation and then release the energy with the resupination, okay? So essentially when we get to terminal stance, which is basically coming forward, it's, we're hoping that we've stored a lot of energy down the frontal um, uh, tissue. So when you come off, you don't have to push off too much really. It's actually just getting swung forward by the, by the um, elastic recoil that's been created. All right, so I think that's probably gone through the footstep quite uh, in detail. And I think I might have gone a little bit quicker than anticipated. So we've got lots of time for questions. So thank you, Tori, for that. We may come back to you in a moment if we've got questions that need a bit of description. So if we... Um, so, Ian, there was uh, just one question uh, with regards to uh, the windlass mechanism. Um, someone was asking, just could you could you briefly go through that um, a little bit more detail, perhaps with the the model on this camera, it might be a little bit easier. Yeah, on um, here. So, can we see that? Yeah. So, I have to do that. So, what we have with the windlass effect. So, I'll try and hold that up. So, you've got the plantar fascia being attached, sort of medial um, calcaneal tubercle is its primary attachment. It then runs as a fairly thick strap up and attaches into the plantar plate of the um, metatarsal um, phal phalangeal joint. So what we mean by a windlass is essentially, hopefully you can see that, as we lift the digit, the, the hallux up, it winds tissue into the um, uh, first metatarsal pharyngeal joint. So that effectively brings the heel closer to the um, forefoot. So there's, there's only so much tissue here. If you wind some of it up, it's gonna essentially do that to the foot. It's gonna bring the heel bone a bit closer. Because the orientation of that is primarily medial to where the talus is, it creates a supernatory force um, to help to recontrol that. So what's really happening there is the big toe gets held rigidly against the ground. And as you lift the heel up, the heel bone gets pulled closer as, it, as you then sort of propel over the top. 
Now that's all contingent on the big toe joint working well. So if somebody's got a bunion or a structural or functional hallux limitus, bit of arthritis perhaps in there, um, it's going to comp uh, compromise that system. So we lose some of the supernatory force um, that we get from that mechanism. Uh, so fascia is quite a, a fascinating subject, which I'm sure lots of you uh, look into. So um, hopefully that answers the question there. Okay. Um, and there's another question uh, from uh, Wessel. Um, do you think the rigid foot segment section in a Vicon is sufficient for modeling ankle power or should more markers be used to differentiate uh, between the foot and ankle? Uh, I'd probably say we want as many markers in there as possible. Um, so the rigid uh, lever that we tend to think of is quite good for modeling the, the general overall movement, but it's, it is hard to get enough markers on the foot without interference between the different bits um, uh, and recording along there. So ideally, yes, you want several markers on there to, to record it. Um, particularly there's, there is some error with the skin moving relative to the bones and that sort of thing, and it is moving quite fast. Um, but yeah, short answer, probably want as many markers on there as we can. And certainly there's that famous study done by Chris Nestor where they uh, went went to Scandinavian countries and drilled the markers into their, their own oh, feet. So uh, I know, I'm quite, I'm quite pleased I wasn't asked to be anything to do with that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think it's, yeah, there's lots of, uh, yeah, it's the only real true study of what's going on, but then we've got lots of, uh, you know, anaesthetics and things involved as well. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, Top marks for uh, dedication to science. Commitment, yes. Um, uh, uh, question from Diane Shaw. How does the push-off mechanism change if perhaps uh, plantar fasciitis is a, is a condition that the patient's suffering with? How, what, what effect might that have? Well, I think so. With the plantar fasciitis, I think the, the first thing in the morning when they've got them, they don't want to do any loading of the plantar fascia at all. As you're, you'll all be aware with your patients, they tend to want to walk on the on their toe or perhaps even roll the foot out and just uh, try and not utilize the fascia at all. Um, it's going to compromise it probably mainly due to pain uh, unless there's a more local effect to the, the problem. So for example, they've got a, an arthritic um, big toe that's stopping that, uh, taking all the load that we want it to. Um, but yeah, it's gonna, it's good. you're gonna have to get the energy from somewhere else. So if you lose the elastic recoil into the, the passive soft tissue of the of the foot, then you're going to have to exert muscular effort in order to cheat for that somewhere else. So, you know, that could be high stepping, it could be quad using quad power, it could be pushing off more with the lesser toes. So we've got um, quite a few options, uh, and that's uh, I think one of the, the the joys of this type of job is everybody's going to cheat in a different way. Uh, mm -hmm. You've then got to try and work out what their what their compensation pattern is. Um, and how to address both the problem and that compensation as well, I think. Okay, and uh, a question from Sean Adams, um, just saying, can you explain the difference between uh, low gear and high gear toe off? Uh, I think generally what's meant by that is if you toe off uh, and you're still in a pronate, a relatively pronate, I'm gonna use the term pronated position. So if your, your foot is still rolled in as you're propelling off, that's going to be not as powerful as a as if your foot's rolling out as a, a, a propelling off. So um, low gear is essentially going to require more effort to push off. The high gear is going to be a stiffer foot as you propel through. But it's not it's not a terminology I commonly use. But um, hopefully that's a reasonable definition of it. Okay. Um, there's another question um, from Nicola Kelly. I'm just saying is that you see a lot of posting laterally uh, in orthoses. Uh, what are your thoughts as we need to land posteriorly and laterally uh, in initial phase? Uh, I think post lateral posting has got become popular certainly over the last few years because um, there's been some uh, some suggestion that you can unload knees uh, by posting laterally. So by applying a force. Uh, laterally to the foot that would create an internal rotation at the tibia and hopefully create a, almost a gapping effect so much like you're uh, achieving more directly with the unloaders um, the hope is that you can do that with the with an insole uh, that certainly requires the foot to be very well put together the foot's got to be working quite well itself and not be capable of excessive pronation otherwise the foot's going to go into a pronation uh, into a more powerful pronation instead uh, I certainly use lateral posting. Um, one of the things, so statistically, I think it's around five to nine percent of the population 
um, are an underpronator or a, or a supernator, they'd often be called. Um, and we would probably see about 40% of our patients might be that. Uh, and I think it's probably because you can sort a lot of the pronatory related issues out with fairly simple um, uh, devices and exercises and things like that. Um, whereas it's much harder if somebody is an underpronator to create a pronatory force with anything other than um, other than insoles. So um, because everything's generally working eccentrically um, to decelerate these movements as your body takes the load onto it or your foot takes the load of your body onto it. Um, we don't really necessarily want it to be so a muscle to be creating a e uh, concentric force well, it should be doing an eccentric force. So it's hard to force the foot to do that pronatory movement. So natural rear foot posting is often used for the under pronators, um, I would say. And then we do use some uh, lateral forefoot posting. Uh, sometimes if the first metatarsal pharyngeal joint is not functioning correctly, sometimes if the, the gait is more generally abducted and we want to provide a nudge to help the more proximal soft tissue in the short term, uh, those sorts of things. So we might look at um, those sorts of corrections. Okay. And uh, from a foot orthosis point of view, um, what are your thoughts in terms of the duration of these are used normally? Certainly historically, these were used for a lot, perhaps a lot longer periods of time than than perhaps current thinking is. What What are your thoughts on on that? Yeah, I think it, I think um, orthotics are probably both under and uh, foot orthosis. This is. Um, are probably both under and over prescribed. So historically, um, they've been used, as, as the question alludes to, um, for longer periods and perhaps permanently. There are cases where an insole um, may be required to be permanent. And I'm gonna go back to the one I've used already. So if you've got uh, an arthritic change to the big toe, um, we're not gonna undo that change. So an orthotic might be a permanent thing um, to try and account for something like that that, that can't be undone. Um, whereas orthotics are probably under prescribed as short term rehabilitation tools. Uh, so something to reju uh, recreate the zone of optimal stress for tissue. Often you can take a patient out of pain so they can achieve a bit more activity uh, and they could even be used as a training aid. So something to help train the soft tissue more locally. So again, if the tibialis posterior has been dysfunctional for a while and all of the passive soft tissue has stretched, um, then you might, might use an orthotic in the short term to give the tibialis posterior back an advantage in its pull and allow the rest of the soft tissue to reshorten around that position along with the exercises that you'd give um, and then the orthotic can be taken away. So in short, they're both under and over prescribed. So there are probably places that we're not using and they could be used, but equally there are people in them for years um, uh, who, who don't necessarily need to be in them. And we, uh, terrible business uh, here, we're often telling people they don't need the insoles anymore or they, we could rehab them out of them or that sort of thing. So um, yeah, I'm not a great businessman on that level. Okay, fantastic. Um, so if there, there are any other uh, questions, uh, we'll, we'll come through to those. Um, but, but thank you very much, uh, Ian, for going through that. Um, this is the, the first of a few of our webinars where we're actually going to, to other locations and showing you different uh, clinics. So we're really appreciative uh, to, to Ian uh, and the Biomechanics Clinic for letting us uh, come and, and see his, his fantastic facility. Um, there's also a question from Nicola Kelly, uh, saying, uh, well, I have a lot of children with orthosis due to pes planus uh, who are not in pain. What is the evidence uh, in preventing foot complaints using orthosis? Uh, not very much that I'm aware of. I think it's, we, uh, all I can do, when, when we look at paediatrics, there isn't too much evidence one way or the other. I haven't, I, I certainly wouldn't look to prescribe for someone who's asymptomatic. And we would look to review them every sort of couple of shoe sizes or every um, year as a minimum uh, review uh, for any orthotic we prescribe for that sort of age group. Um, yeah, I'm, there's not real evidence that you're going to. So most of the most of the thing that is causing a foot to be flat um, is um, either the topography of the joints the laxity of the muscle, muscle uh, laxity of the sort of joints that allow an increased range of movement, or the foot has to flatten for some other reason. So the foot's the get out of jail free card for the limb uh, and pronation is the method by which it does it. Um, so the orthotic for most of those would be a temporary thing at that sort of age. 
uh, and then kept under review. So that would be how we would uh, approach it. Okay, fantastic. Um, so just, oh, another question just popped up. Uh, at what point should physiotherapists refer out to a podiatrist uh, regarding the management of chronic plantar fasciitis? Uh, well, I think chronic is mainly what I see. So I don't see that many um, acute ones. People tend to come to me when nothing else has worked. So I think plantar fasciitis is, a, is, a, is a, an umbrella term. So I've certainly looked to be certain of the diagnosis first because lots of things get diagnosed with plantar fasciitis that aren't necessarily uh, an actual tearing, fraying or crushing of the, of the plantar fascia at its origin. Uh, there are lots of different heel pains uh, available. Um, so I would probably say if all the things that should have worked haven't worked or it keeps coming back, that would be the time that I would expect to see a, a patient referred. So you know, you've done all the rehab, you've done all the, any therapies that you think are appropriate, you've given the standard uh, and advanced sort of uh, uh, therapies that you would, if that plantar fasciitis just keeps coming back or won't shift, uh, then that would be when I'd expect a referral um, from physiotherapy. Okay, and on the subject of plantar fasciitis, um, do you inject uh, for, for plantar fasciitis? Uh, again, because most of the patients that I see have had it for months to years, I don't think there's much efficacy in the steroid injections at that point. Um, I think the steroids do have effect if they're in an acute phase where the, the plantar fascia has been recently injured. Um, so it's not something that I do, but we do occasionally refer out to it depending on how we, when we get them. Okay, fantastic. Well, um, I think that's, that's most of the questions. Uh, thank you very much to Ian uh, for, for covering uh, this. It's just a, a quick run through, uh, and I think it's really good and, and great detail uh, for us there. Um, so if you do have any further questions, do send them through. We can always pass those through to Ian and then we'll respond to those as we go. Um, there um, just really remains uh, for us to, to say thank you uh, to the guys. Um, thank you to Aj uh, <laughs> as well for, for manning the camera uh, throughout. It's not easy uh, doing that. And then we're just going to uh, obviously talk about the, the next webinar, uh, which is actually uh, being done um, by Pure, Sport, uh, Pure Sports Medicine. Uh, we're going to Canary Wharf and we'll be uh, running the session from there. Um, so uh, with Mr. Paul Tricker, who's done uh, some of our previous sessions, but effectively they're going to be doing a, a very practical webinar on ACL and o, uh, OA knee management. Uh, and again, uh, as I mentioned, live uh, from Canary Wharf. Um, so we'll be putting a link uh, for you uh, so that you can register for that uh, straight away. Uh, that'll be put into the chat in a moment. Um, so thank you very much, Ian. Uh, we'll just briefly go over to him to... Uh, to, yeah. to Thank you very much for, I hope it was a, a worthwhile use for Wednesday evening. I think we've got one more poll we were going to do, which is basically, um, I suppose, to essentially, uh, how confident are you feeling of doing uh, an assessment for foot and ankle um, uh, in gait? So I'll pop that one up. Um, so how confident do you feel about assessing the foot in its role for gait, in role in gait, apologies. So we're up to about 60%. There we go, and I'll stop it about there. We're just at about 80% and then share those results. So uh, we've got 21% saying very confident, 42% saying fairly confident, 35 average, and then 2% not very confident. So good results all around. We like an above average score, that's good. <laughs> um, so thank you very much. Uh, really appreciate uh, your uh, your session this evening, Ian. Something very different from some of the sessions we've done before. Uh, you know, Ian said himself on LinkedIn that this, this would uh, be an ambitious session, and I think it's think it's worked very well. So thank you very much uh, to Ian. Um, uh, thank you for joining us tonight. Um, as I mentioned, the next session will be in two weeks. Um, so hopefully you can join us for that one. Thank you very much. Thank you.